Now, for those not familiar with public health surveillance, can you tell me what does epidemiology mean? There are many, many different definitions of epidemiology, but uh, epidemiology basically is the study of all of the factors that may be relevant uh, for the distribution uh, of disease or conditions in the population. So we, we're almost, I guess, infectious disease epidemiologists would be something similar to sort of uh, disease detectives. That uh, if uh, something occurred, we needed to find out how is this transmitted, uh, to who may be at risk, and how can it be prevented. And going off that, can you explain to me what the five W's are of epidemiology and how they were implemented um, when the first case of Gottlieb was reported? Well, some people like to use, you know, the, the five W's. I use them, the who of whom developed what, when, where, and why. And if you answer these questions, you're basically doing epidemiology. In what way are international agencies and faith-based AIDS organizations uh, more socially, politically, and moralistically correct, um, more than epidemiologically accurate? Well, let me just first start with faith-based organizations. I think faith-based organizations look upon sexual promiscuity as a sin. And from their perspective, any uh, prohibition or prevention of that type of sex is important. Now, from the epidemiologic point of view, there are certain levels and patterns of sex that will lead to HIV epidemics. And I think public health needs to focus on those populations with those risk behaviors, rather than trying to eliminate, say, uh, sex among teenagers, which in itself is probably vital for the faith-based organization, but for public health it's not essential for the prevention of HIV epidemics. Okay. Now you say that HIV prevalence is low in most populations throughout the world and can expect to remain low. This is not a message that we hear from CDC and UNAIDS and other organizations. How do you justify that statement? Well, if you just look at all of the data. I mean, take a, if we look at the most recent UNAIDS data, they estimate about 30, 40 million, actually they, they use about 40 million uh, adults and children infected. So that translates to about half of a percent of the total world's population. Because the total world's population is well over six billion. So you t we're talking about half of a percent. Uh, and that probably is the maximum number that will be present. So it's not going to overtake the world. And of that half of a percent, 80 about 80% of those infections are concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so that leaves very little for distribution in other parts of the world. So if we take California, for example, uh, I think the estimate of HIV infections in California is in the range of about 100,000, mostly in injecting drug users and in men who have sex with men and then in the sort of the regular sex partners of some of these infected uh, IDU and, and homosexual, bisexual men. And there's virtually no other in infections. And this has been now 25 years. I don't expect this pattern to change. The introduction of HIV into any population for epidemic spread to occur requires the exchange of a significant amount of either infected blood or infected sexual secretions. So we're not talking about something like influenza virus where I can be infected 
And by just talking, uh, everybody in this room, uh, or in a room that I would be talking at, would be exposed and, and the majority of them might get infected. Now if I was HIV infected, the likelihood of my exchanging significant amount of infected blood or uh, sexual fluids with people is, depends on sexual behavior and sexual networks. And if we look at where epidemic sexual transmission of HIV has occurred, has only occurred in those populations where there are many, many people who have multiple sex partners and have what we call frequent daily or weekly sex partner exchange. They have different sex partners uh, in either small or large networks. And you get epidemic HIV transmission in those settings. And where do you find those settings? In, in gay men and MSM in bathhouses will have that type of uh, level of sexual behavior. In large brothel type uh, commercial sex establishments in some of the cities in, in India, in Thailand, Cambodia, you will have that level of uh, sexual partner exchange. Without that, you will not get epidemic spread. So what would happen if we took away uh, men who have sex with men and intravenous drug users out of the developed world? What would we see in terms of HIV prevalence? Uh, it would be a rare infection from person who somehow got infected from traveling, say, to Africa or to uh, somebody traveling to Asia and having sex or or injecting drug sharing needles with some infected person outside of the United States. To backtrack a little bit, the, at the present time, the estimate from UNAIDS would translate into about half of a percent of the total world's population uh, HIV infected. Uh, and this has been over the course of 25 years, or since the recognition of, of HIV, the AIDS pandemic. If we had an influenza pandemic, the feared bird flu or whatever, uh, all of the previous influenza pandemics would infect uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the total world population. So we're talking about several orders of magnitude difference in terms of uh, influenza within three or six months infecting 50, 60 percent of the world pop population, and HIV infecting over the last 25 years uh, half of a percent, and most of those in sub-Saharan Africa, and practically all of those in individuals who have high HIV risk behaviors. So uh, looking at the HIV numbers, we can, by knowing the interrelationship between HIV incidents, that is, new infections, AIDS deaths, and how many people are estimated to be HIV infected, we can use modeling to estimate what the annual numbers of HIV infections globally had to be to reach this point. And based on those models, specifically modeling in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we, the conclusion is that if we model the HIV prevalence curves that have been estimated using the data, HIV incidence, annual numbers of new HIV infections, would have had to peak, have peaked in, during the 1990s. And UNAIDS, in their May 2006 report to UNGLASS, which is, I guess, the United Nations Special Session on AIDS, uh, acknowledged that globally, HIV, annual HIV incidence probably peaked by the late 1990s. Well, since 
recognition of the AIDS pandemic, looking at where epidemics have occurred, they have occurred primarily in those populations that have high HIV risk behaviors. And these behaviors are injecting, injecting drug users who share needles with lots of other injecting drug users or IDUs. Uh, gay men, men who have sex with men with multiple sex partners, uh, sometimes 10 to 20 different partners in a single night or weekend. Uh, that level of uh, risk behavior, we've seen epidemics. And we've seen epidemics in some Asian countries where we have large uh, commercial sex networks where the prostitutes have 10 to 20 clients per night. Other than those situations, we have not seen epidemic spread. So that if we take the situation in California, the estimate of HIV infections in California a few years ago was about 100,000 HIV infections. But if you took away HIV infections in injecting drug users in the IDU population, about 10% of them were estimated to be infected. You take away the MSM, the men who have sex with men infections, and again, about close to 10, 11% of MSM in California are estimated to be infected. Uh, you're left with almost no infections. The only other infections in California would be the regular sex partners of infected injecting drug users and the regular sex partners of the infected bisexual men. So within the heterosexual population, there really is no, nothing to drive transmission of HIV because HIV is usually very, very difficult to transmit uh, by a single sexual contact. What are your thoughts on the, the mantra, we're all at risk? Everyone's at equal risk. I would prefer to say that we should all be concerned, but we clearly are not all at, at equal risk. I think even in sub-Saharan Africa, where using the UN AIDS statistics, 3% of the total population in sub-Saharan Africa is infected. That means 97% are not infected. And this is after 25 years. So there are pockets where there are very, very high infection levels, but that's totally related to the level of risk behavior. And levels of risk behaviors are not that high in the majority of populations throughout the world. Well, I actually, to, to go back, I started with a international research fellowship uh, with the Hooper Foundation to, that enabled me to spend three years looking at uh, the epidemiology of infectious diseases. Uh, one year in San Francisco, two years at the Institute for Medical Research in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And when I came back from that fellowship, I joined the California State Health Department and was involved in uh, field research evaluating uh, influenza and adenovirus and respiratory disease vaccines in uh, Army recruits at Fort Ord. And then from that job, I switched over to the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control in California. I became chief of the bureau within a couple of years because everybody retired and uh, worked in California for about uh, 15, 20 years until the AIDS problem uh, developed in 81. And then in 87, I took early retirement from the state, California State Health Department to join John Mann in Geneva because I knew John from his days in New Mexico, and I knew John was, uh, and John asked if uh, he could get some epidemiologic support and help. And I said, well, I'd be perfectly willing to take early retirement and join WHO and uh, assist him. How accurate are HIV estimates coming out of Africa today? Uh, They're reasonably accurate compared to m any estimates of any other, say, uh, major infectious disease. So that if, if you look at estimates of malaria, estimates of uh, HIV would be as accurate as uh, estimates of uh, malaria. And by saying that, it's not very accurate.
you could be tremendous ranges in the estimate. So that if the estimate of UN estimate is, say, roughly uh, 30 million HIV infections in Africa, say, in, in the year 2006, uh, it probably could be as low as, could be less than 20 million, it could be uh, uh, more than 40 million. And UNAIDS has uh, used an estimate of about 30 million. But based on some better data collection, uh, the population-based uh, studies that have been carried out mainly in African countries, but uh, in some other developing countries since, since uh, about the year 2000, uh, the estimate, HIV prevalence estimates in Africa probably have been reduced on average by about close to 50 percent. So I would think my critical analysis of, of the numbers of HIV infections in Africa now in the adult population would be probably closer to 20 million rather than 30 million. Yeah, the es estimation and projection of HIV AIDS numbers, I believe, is more of an art than a science because there's no accepted method that everybody agrees on as being, as giving the most accurate answer. So different epidemiologists will use different methods, models, then the, the type of data collected uh, and the assumptions used for those data also can vary tremendously. So that the, the assumption that antenatal clinic uh, data, that's HIV testing of pregnant women, could be used as an indirect surrogate indicator of what the prevalence of HIV might be in both males and females in that population was an assumption used to make estimates, uh, HIV estimates in, in, in Africa. Now, this was used because this type of blood collection was easy. Uh, pregnant women, by definition, are easy to identify. And they do go to antenatal clinics, and so you can collect blood samples from them, and then if, if all of the assumptions hold, then you would be able to, on a periodic basis, determine what the HIV prevalence is in that population of adults. But since use of this method, and I'm, uh, this has been shown to have tremendous overestimation bias. And the reason for this is because most of the antenatal clinics used in the sentinel surveillance systems in Africa are urban-based. And we know that urban HIV rates are much higher than they are in the rural population. So one of the major initial problems was they took data from urban antenatal clinics and extrapolated them to the total population, which resulted in tremendous overestimation. Uh, and I think population-based uh, HIV surveys that have been carried out has, have indicated that this is so, and this is the, the primary basis for the reduction of uh, HIV prevalence estimates in, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and I think shortly it will also result in such a r marked reduction in the estimate in India. Oh, I, I was on the phone with our office in New Delhi, in, in India, with, our, uh, with one of my deputies. So we're doing a review as we do a program review of uh, the office. And India is a big country and is a, a country with many challenges and a, uh, an AIDS epidemic, and a big one in some places. Um, so that, uh, I don't know, did you go to India also? No, we didn't yeah, go to yeah, India. Yeah. What are the numbers like in India? Um, Something like five and a half million people with HIV, but it's more than in South Africa. But of course, there is um, the denominator population denominator is one billion. So that's uh, as an average, it it doesn't sound uh, much. But there are districts in India where four percent of um, pregnant women are HIV positive. That's and a district in India is one to two million people, which is bigger than 
people more than um, than Botswana, for example, as a as a country. So it's the, the potential for a serious uh, epidemic in in many states is huge. Let's, let's talk about India because uh, PDPR and UNAIDS maintains that there are roughly five plus million people infected. Um, what are your thoughts on that number? Well, based on the population-based studies that have been carried out in India in last year, in 2006, and especially the, the work of uh, uh, Lalit Dandona and his colleagues uh, that have shown that prevalence used the methods used to estimate HIV prevalence in India by the national program has resulted, at least in their studies, in an overestimation of 60%. So if you apply that to the UN AIDS and the Indian program estimate of between 5 and 6 million, uh, that correction factor, uh, it would only be about 2 million. That's a pretty big difference. It's a big difference, big, big difference. One month after my interview with Dr. Piat, the Indian government slashed their estimates by nearly 60%. Shortly thereafter, UNAIDS acknowledged they'd been overestimating global HIV statistics for more than a decade. When we talked on the phone at one point, you also talked about that India had just gotten their increase in, a five-fold increase in funding. They, the National AIDS Program, I think, had asked for a five-fold increase in in, uh, in bu their budget for the next five years. And it was based on, the, at least the treatment budget, was based on the five or six million infections. So clearly if the actual, if, if the revised estimate is, say, only uh, one or two million compared to five or six million, then the, the amount that they requested for the treatment budget uh, needs to be modified. And does that actually get modified, or does that money still... I, I have no idea. Okay. I'm not involved in any of those high finance programs. Now, what are some of the biggest reversals you've seen in, in uh, HIV estimates? Well, if you just look at uh, some of the estimates made by the national programs and UN, accepted by UNAIDS and some of the recent sort of uh, revisions based on... Uh, and, and these revisions have been accepted by UNAIDS. Uh, you, Kenya went from about 2.4 million infections down to 1.2 million. So it was, it was cut in half. Uh, I think Ethiopia, the demographic health survey in 2005, suggested the uh, prevalence was, I think, 0.6% whereas uh, the, no, no, I'm sorry, I think in Ethiopia it was 1.6 percent by the DHS survey, whereas it was close to 6 percent uh, based on antenatal uh, data, the method that uh, had been used before. So it was almost uh, a two-fold difference in, in reduction. Which is the one that we saw on your computer that was almost 300, 400 percent? I think that might have been the Ethiopia. Yeah. Okay. And there we're talking about maybe, you know, Ethiopia is a pretty large country. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about percent reduction, we're talking about maybe close to a million, a reduction of about maybe a million. Now, my biggest concern is the problem of projecting explosive epidemics in general populations. So you hear the rhetoric, uh, HIV is on the brink of exploding. Uh, in China. It's on the brink of exploding in the Philippines. It's on the brink of exploding in Bangladesh. And it's not going to happen. Okay. Because the majority of the population does not have sufficient HIV risk behaviors to drive epidemic HIV transmission. And what are some of these wild projections that, have, that we've seen in places like China? Well, the, actually, the, the projections in China were not that wild, I think uh, for a population the size of China, they, the, the initial UNAIDS Titanic projection that was produced actually in the, in the 1990s for the year 2000 was 10 million infections. But when the year 2000 came by and there were not 10 million infections, uh, 
uh, they, someone else took that projection in 2002 and said by the year 2010, there would be 10 million infections. Now this is 2007, and I, I think that in China at the present time, it's, it's probably closer to half a million than to one million in terms of the estimate. So to reach 10 million within a few years, I think, is going to be almost impossible. And the projections for India would be uh, the U.S. National Intelligence Council, which I think is a contradiction of terms, predicted in, I think, again, in around 2002, that by 2010, there would be about 20 million infections, HIV infections in China and about 18 and a half million infections in India. And I don't, those numbers are, it'll have to literally explode to get close to those numbers, and it's not going to. Okay. Now, how many different models are used today for estimating HIV? Uh, there are as many different models as there are modelers. Uh, so every mathematician will sit down and uh, develop their own sort of model, but uh, there are two or three main models that are still sort of generally used by a lot of people. One is the back calculation model, but the problem with the back calculation model is it de requires reliable reported annual AIDS case. And if you don't have reliable annual AIDS cases, then the back calculation is then turns to garbage. And the same thing with um, uh, an epi model that uh, uh, I developed which back in the late 1980s. It was a very similar model developed by other people. It's basically a spreadsheet model that uses the, the, the same kinds of parameters. Uh, and the problem with th this model, which uses HIV prevalence, estimated HIV prevalence as the main input parameter to the model. And from that, you can then derive annual HIV incidence, annual AIDS deaths. The problem now is that it required sort of the median progression from HIV infection to AIDS to be uh, along the natural path, which is so a median of eight years. And that's what the model is based on. Now with treatment, that messes up the progression from HIV infection to AIDS, and therefore the whole use of the two basic models uh, because of treatment uh, will no longer be possible. What about the third one? Uh, the third one is, is, I don't think it's used anymore. There was a, what was called the interagency workgroup model, IWG model developed, by, it was by the State Department, so I don't know what intelligence unit uh, threw money at it. But uh, this was developed during the late 1980s and 1990s at a reported cost of maybe $10 million. And this model will tell you anything you want to know. But you have to input 350 separate data sets. Each data set by age, sex, and urban-rural distribution. Okay. And once you have that, the model will tell you about uh, AIDS cases and, and HIV infections. But if you had reliable 350 data sets, you wouldn't need, you would also know about HIV AIDS, I think. So I don't think anybody uses it anymore. What about the Delphi model? The Delphi just uh, is just using uh, expert opinion. Okay. So the Delphi method is, uh, it's good when you have absolutely no data. So you have to rely on sort of ex experts. And you, you ask a dozen experts, how many? Mm -hmm. And then you add them up and you average it out and then you call them back and you say, well, you know, you said this, the experts said this, there's the lowest was this, the highest was this. Do you want to change your estimate? And so they basically use this method to drive towards a consensus. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the Delphi method, yeah. which is not very scientific. 
in the absence of data or any other method, uh, it's, it's better than nothing, maybe. Was that used at all in, in statistics? Oh, the first projection of AIDS in the world was a Delphi method that uh, my unit did, uh, GPA, the Global Program on AIDS, and this was, I think, in 1989. And we published, I think, uh, the results of uh, the Adelphi method. And I think the problem is that you, you had a lot of, quote, AIDS experts who, who were convinced that the sky was going to fall down. And so their projections were fairly large. So it, it has since uh, not turned out to be as disastrous as uh, the, Del the initial Delphi uh, projections were and then throw bones and then read it. That, that was the oracles of Delphi to, to make projections of the future. Oh, that's what you, that's this what is the, it. No, I, it's not what I call it. This was a, the Delphi method was a, a, a statistical method used in, in business. So that if, you know, if General Electric wanted to know what, what is the future market for fluorescent light bulbs in uh, Timbuktu, mm -hmm. They would call all of the experts in Timbuktu and uh, say, you know, 10 years from now, how many fluorescent light bulbs do you think uh, are needed? You know? Okay. Rather than, you know, making up a number out of uh, nothing. They would go to people who might know, have a better, better right. estimate. How long, would, how long did you guys use that model in Africa? We didn't use it in Africa. We used it for, uh, oh, just global, for projections. global projections. Okay. What kind of significant errors can actually occur um, when somebody's inputting data into like a sentinel estimate if they make a mistake? I don't worry about those mistakes because there's the, the, the quality of the data is, is uh, uh, first and foremost uh, not the best. See, these are not uh, research studies. Uh, I, I should backtrack to say what the origin of sentinel surveillance was. Uh, I have to admit, I developed Sentinel surveillance when I was given the job of global surveillance. And what I developed was a system to monitor HIV trends. So my thinking was that if we could look at a defined population, an antenatal women, STD clinic, uh, military recruits, uh, blood bank donors. If we could follow those populations periodically, every three months, whatever, uh, we could look at what the prevalence level would be, whether, number one, whether HIV was present in that population, yes or no. Whether the prevalence trend, the, the infection rate, was stable, increasing rapidly, or decreasing. Uh, that's what HIV sentinel surveillance was developed to do. And I think it still is very good for that type of surveillance, monitoring in general what is happening to HIV trends. But when people said, we want to know how many infected people there are, the only way you could then determine that would be with HIV testing. And the only HIV test data sets available were sentinel surveillance sites. So they rushed in. By that time, I had left WHO 92. And I kept telling them that, you know, there is significant bias in the antenatal data because the most of the uh, urban, et cetera, et cetera, that I urged them to do studies to confirm that antenatal data could be reliably used as a surrogate. Uh, they, they never did it, or not to the extent that they should have. And they continued to use the available uh, grab samples and uh, make estimates uh, derived from uh, those data. Okay. So the, the tremendous bias. Now, in your book, you stated, I was told by a colleague, that 
uh, an administrative decision was made in 1997 to use higher uh, range of HIV estimates rather than lower range. Mm -hmm. Why is UNAIDS tendency to always overestimate and favor higher numbers? Well, all I can tell you is that uh, at, at that time, apparently, Mike Merson, I think, who, no, it wasn't Mike Merson, it was 97, this is, uh, who, whoever were in the program had come back from Washington, and the people in Washington, I think USAID and, and others, were concerned that the numbers were not going up uh, as fast as they thought that they ought to. And so they had this meeting, and this is in a unit that were basically that put together the numbers. This was my old uh, unit. Uh, they came back and they said, when we make these estimates, we have a low estimate, we have a high estimate. And we've been taking a very conservative estimate near the lower range. All we need to do is just take, revise, instead of taking an estimate using an estimate towards the lower range, take an estimate towards the higher range. They never took the highest, but th they bumped it up. And uh, I showed in my book, if you look at the prevalence curves for Africa, it just, in 1997, just started to shoot up like a rocket. Mm. Okay. And of course, most reporters and journalists don't realize the reason yeah. behind that. Yeah. What was the meeting that was taking place in Washington? I, I think it was just a lot series of meetings. Okay. Between UNAIDS and... Uh, and okay. Congress, maybe, I don't know, USAID. Okay. Now, if the HIV AIDS estimates are inflated, does that, does that correspondingly mean that AIDS deaths and AIDS orphans and the volumes of drugs needed to treat patients is also inflated? Correct. It would have to be. I mean, if, if you're basing a treatment uh, program for the population and you're basing in India on an estimated five or six million, uh, you, when the actual number may be two million, you clearly uh, have overestimated uh, for your treatment program. Would, do you want to do a little piece about the sausage that you talk about in your book? I thought that was great. Well, I just basically say that if, if there's the saying that if, if you knew how sausages, what sausages are made of, most people would hesitate to sort of eat them because they, they wouldn't like what's in it. And if you knew how HIV AIDS numbers are cooked uh, or made up, you would use them with extreme caution. Now, let me go back to the beginning. We were talking a little about the current uh, status. How accurate were the first AIDS estimates in the United States? And how do those numbers compare to the estimates of today? Well, the first estimate was in the cool font AIDS meeting in West Virginia, I think, in 1986. Uh, there was a small group, and I remember that Warren Winkelstein was there, Jim Curran was there, I was there, I think Harold Ginsburg was there from the drug program, uh, Moran from the CDC was there. There were about half a dozen of us, and uh, we had to overnight come up with an estimate to present to the conference the next day. Uh, and it was after about two bottles of bourbon that we finally came to a consensus uh, that was w between one and one and a half million. And that estimate has been so good that it's been consistently used. And it's, at the present time, the cumulative number of HIV infections in the United States is between one and one and a half million. So it's, it was a very good estimate. Wait, was that estimate, was that estimate though just for that? Correct. That, it that was, present time? Yeah, it, oh, was, okay. it was obviously overestimated, but it was, it was so good that the, the CDC has kept that estimate and it's still valid estimate now. Okay, 26 years later. That's right, it's between one and one and a half million. When did you start developing strictly African statistics? Uh, we, we did it for about a dozen countries, the, the high, highly affected countries in, uh, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, based on the antenatal data. But I 
conservatively said that we had no rural data. And unless we had rural data, I would only use one-tenth of the urban data to apply to the rural populations, unless we had rural data to, to suggest that we should use a different ratio. And that was basically uh, what I applied for some of the initial uh, estimates in Africa. I described it very briefly in my book because I resigned from WHO and GPA in 1992. Uh, UNAIDS was created in 1995, I believe. And the background for the creation of uh, UNAIDS was, uh, by the time I was leaving the global program on AIDS in 92, I could feel the tension with regard to the position that GPA, the global program on AIDS, headed by John Mann, and then at the time I left by Mike Merson, uh, carved out a very, very prominent global position for AIDS prevention and uh, programs. So that GPA, WHO, was basically what I called the gatekeeper for all AIDS programs internationally. So the, no funding, no staffing, uh, no AIDS prevention plans could be enacted in any country without having to go through GPA and the country AIDS program. Uh, a lot of the international agencies, uh, UN agencies, didn't like that. UNICEF wanted to go in and do their thing on mothers and children. And we said, no, you come in and do injecting drug users and men who have sex with men. And they said, no thanks. They wanted to do you know, mothers and children. So GPA was stopping some fairly big programs from going into countries. Uh, and then when Mike Merson came in, uh, he began to decentralize GPA. And there's a long history to that, which uh, I think people need to read the book. But when Hafton Mala was the head of WHO, he gave John Mann total support to do almost anything. And what John did was to bypass all of the regional offices of WHO for the Global Program on AIDS. We were able to contact visit, fund any country in any region without having to get the approval of the regional office, which in WHO was, was basically uh, uh, heresy. Had, the bureaucracy was everything had to go through the regional offices. All right, when Hafton Mahler stepped down and Nakajima was made the uh, head of WHO, I. I am convinced that one of his election promises to the regional offices was, when I get in to be head of WHO, GPA will no longer bypass the regional offices. Okay. So Mike then began to decentralize and to carry out Nakajima's wishes that funding from GPA was now going to go through the regional offices to the countries. And in that process, uh, there was tremendous hiccups. And uh, so countries were not getting support. It was be being hung up in this reorganization. All of the UN agencies and all of the major donors w wanted to get in, involved, and uh, they all lobbied to get out from under WHO. And they created then this umbrella joint United Nations program on AIDS. And when that was created, the first thing Peter Piat said, and he said was that UNAIDS is an advocacy agency, pure and simple. And he divested himself of all of the program aspects and the scientific aspects of, of, of AIDS except one unit, and he kept sort of the numbers unit. And 
So UNAIDS now has been involved in, quote, coordination rather than as a gatekeeper for uh, AIDS funding and programs in countries. And is there a conflict of interest there with UNAIDS? Keeping there can be, can be, because if you're an advocacy agency and you perceive low numbers to be bad, uh, your bias may be to accept higher numbers even if uh, they're not scientifically sound. Uh, when do you think we'll start getting more accurate estimates, accurate reporting out of Africa? I don't think we'll ever get more accurate. I think the methods will be more accurate. The population-based surveys are, are, are basically random sampling surveys. So those will probably give the, the best data, and those data sh show lower numbers. Are estimates used to strengthen advocacy efforts uh, by certain AIDS organizations around the world? Well, I honestly believe that most AIDS advocacy organizations believe in the high numbers. Uh, from the very beginning, they have recognized that some governments and some official agencies tended to downplay uh, or minimize the AIDS numbers. And so there's been a distrust by AIDS advocates of some of the official numbers uh, as being too low, whereas in reality, as described in terms of some of the problems in the estimation, that some of the estimations may be too high. Uh, I recall that Steve Joseph, when he was Commissioner of Health in New York City, uh, brought together a expert panel to review the estimated numbers of uh, infections, HIV infections in New York City. And overnight, the estimate went from 400,000 to 200,000 because they recognized that based on the methods and based on the data available, it was grossly overestimated and 200,000 was a more realistic estimate. Uh, Steve Joseph, I think, was almost run out of New York City by uh, AIDS Act Up and by the AIDS ad advocates because they, they thought that this was a deliberate attempt by Steve Joseph to cut the AIDS budget in half Where by cutting that? the numbers in half. Where was that? New York City in uh, probably in the late 1980s. What is the danger of media and journalists blindly and uncritically accepting high estimates from UN AIDS? Well, they then <clears throat> continue to perpetuate uh, some of these myths that uh, the numbers are ever increasing when they're not and that, uh, that HIV is on the brink of exploding when it's not. And I think it's, uh, these were sort of either myths or misconceptions I think developed at the very beginning when we didn't know that much about the epidemiology of HIV. And I, I think if I were to say what I've been saying for the last almost 10 years, in the early days, I would have been labeled sort of a, a AIDS denialist uh, that uh, when I say that the majority, vast majority of the uh, world's population is not at any measurable risk of HIV infection. Well, I think <clears throat> the situation in, in, in Russia and the Ukraine, I, I think, are tremendously overblown. I mean, uh, it's been over a million for the past decade in, uh, in Russia. And I think one of these days they'll have to send some sensible epidemiologists in to take a good hard look at, at the situation and uh, come up with more realistic numbers. So it's been a constant estimation of just over a million in Ukraine and yeah. Russia? Yeah. And what, in your opinion, is, is stopping them? Because, I mean, if you're, if you're a mathematician and you're sitting down and you're looking at the numbers, and it's constantly the same one, wouldn't you say that either the epidemic has peaked or that we need to revise our estimates? Or wouldn't you have some kind of inkling that something might be wrong with the model? Well, the, I think in, in, in Russia, I think the, the amount of money that's being poured in now is uh, getting them not to reverse their numbers. They don't want the, the high numbers to come down. In fact, each, each 
estimation is generally a little higher than the previous one. And uh, eventually, I think it's going to have to be validated. I, I just don't believe those numbers. It, now, not to take away from the numbers that do exist, the tantrum numbers that really do exist, but in your opinion, are numbers by certain countries or heads of state really used to just generate income for the country in an unethical fashion? I don't think they deliberately started off doing that, but uh, I think that clearly they see that these numbers are associated with a lot of money coming in also. So that there's not a very great desire on their part to try to you know, lower those numbers by uh, more accurate uh, studies. Okay. In terms of UNAIDS, the people that are doing the models, uh, one thing in interesting thing you said was they're not epidemiologists, but they're all mathematicians? The, the problem is the definition of an epidemiologist. You see, I have, uh, there are epidemiologists and there are epidemiologists. I think the majority of the people that I know that are advising uh, UNAIDS are, are demographers and modelers. And I don't know of how many uh, really critical epidemiologists there are that are responsible for making up the numbers. One thing you said in your book was traditional public health programs um, do not currently have the capability or the expertise for changing population risk behavior. Why is that? Because I think that w human behavior change is uh, something new. I mean, when I went to medical school and when I trained in public health, uh, we had health education specialists who would make posters and uh, draft press releases. But does this change behavior? So it's the whole, how do you go about telling people not to smoke? You can tell them, but then how do you actually become effective in the methods you're using to change population behavior? And that's what I'm saying, is that the, it, there's a, it, it's, a, to me, a new field. I think my generation of public health people uh, wasn't trained or very experienced uh, or had much expertise in that. And I basically uh, said to uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, staff people when he was governor of California and I was head of the infectious disease program in, in California, we had a big epidemic of uh, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases in, in adolescents and uh, young adults in California in the mid-1970s. And I was hauled up to Sacramento and, and his, uh, the governor's people told me that this is unacceptable, do something about it. And I said I could do something about the STD control program can get it sort of to investigate cases and treat cases and uh, do that. I said, but what's behind it is the storm of sexual behaviors in teenagers. And I, I'm not trained or have the expertise or staff to change sexual behaviors in the teenage population in California. I'm an epidemiologist. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, all right, we'll transfer then the STD unit out from under your program and move it up to Sacramento to somebody that can do a better job. So do you have any ideas of how to go about changing people's behavior patterns? Nancy Reagan said, just say no. And that's one. And the, abs the Bush administration says, you know, an abstinence program mm -hmm. to pledge abstinence. Uh, no, I, I do not believe I have any expertise to be talking about how to, how to go about human changing human behavior. That is up to sort of a new, a new generation of, of people, and that's what I recommend, that they begin to sort of apply sort of uh, scientific methods and do, do quantitative studies of risk behavior to measure them and see whether or not what they're doing is actually changing it or not. Most researchers and activists believe that a vaccine is the answer to everything. Uh, but you say it will not be the magic bullet that public and policy makers are hoping for. Well, it can't be. It can't be. I think that, let's take male circumcision. Uh, one simple surgical procedure will confer a 60% protection. Okay? And you don't have to have boosters or redo it every couple of years. Uh, a vaccine, if it can be produced, 
and you know they've been trying for the last what 20 years uh, and they still claim to be 10 years away but so if today they were able to get an AIDS vaccine licensed and ready for use that vaccine at best would not match probably the 60 percent efficacy of male circumcision it might but it's not going to be 90 hundred percent effective that's number one number two who are you going to give it to number three the cost and it's probably going to be a multi-dose uh, vaccine it's probably not going to be cheap so let's say you then are able to mount a big AIDS vaccine program who do you give it to and what current HIV prevention that we're carrying out now A, B, C, uh, all of it uh, screening of blood for uh, blood banks etc what of all of the prevention measures that we have in place now will we eliminate the answer is we have to keep all of them as well as adding on a vaccine which will be good but the expense of that will be, this is going to be then additive not detract so I'm, I'm not in any way trying to say a AIDS vaccine shouldn't be developed but it's going to be the beginning of a lot of headaches for policymakers and and parents as to you know are you going to give your child the AIDS vaccine mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing this now with the what the cancer vaccine for for girls the papilloma yeah yeah so it's it's whether or not the AIDS vaccine will be a universal vaccine mm -hmm. and would it be a universal vaccine when 99 plus percent of the world's population are not at measurable risk of sexually transmitted HIV we see in Eastern Africa in some southern African countries we see in Cambodia we see in the Caribbean less people becoming infected as a result of massive prevention programs uh, based on condom uh, use, on um, reduction of sex partners and being faithful, and on um, starting later with first sexual intercourse for, for young people. That has truly had an impact, and for the first time we start seeing a return on the investment, if I may say so. One thing you talk about is the Uganda success story mm -hmm. and Zambia. Mm -hmm. No, Zambia. South Africa. I contrast contrast uh, Uganda with South Africa but in terms of whether they actually oh. had a successful prevention program correct or if it was just the estimates being lowered well it's yeah it's can you talk about about that situation that scenario yeah well if if you look at HIV prevalence alone and you have inconsistent methods of estimation uh, a decrease in in the prevalence could be because of the methodology and not because HIV prevalence is decreasing mm -hmm. so that has to be evaluated I think there are lots of data for Uganda to show that behavior was changing and that there was in fact uh, changes in the prevalence and incidence curves uh, in different populations that went along with the prevention measures to show that they were probably uh, responsible for some of that decrease with any infectious disease epidemic there's sort of the epidemic period where incidents new infections are going up the rate of new infections will be going up then it reaches sort of a peak level where it begins to level off in terms of the new infections and then it begins the post peak would begin to come down now if you implement prevention at the post peak period prevalence is coming down and if you use then a decreasing HIV prevalence to say how successful your prevention program was your prevention program may have added to the de decrease but how much of that decrease was a natural decrease is going to be argued okay and that's something that nobody talks about too well they don't want to think about it when I raise this they'll say you don't believe that the, these
methods are effective. I said, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there are these different stages of epidemic spread. And, if, and I give a couple of examples in my book where if you look at the gay men cohort in San Francisco, the prevention programs was, were started in 1986. But if we look at the prevalence curves and the modeled incidence curves, HIV incidence in that cohort peaked in 1983 and went down. And then the prevention program came in 1986. So we cannot credit the prevention program from, for that decrease. But I was chief of the program in that, th those days, so I would gladly take credit for it. <laughs> but I, as an epidemiologist, I know that that had nothing to do with the prevention program. Do you see, in the next 50 to 100 years, HIV just extinguishing itself from our population? No, no. Genital herpes is uh, probably the best sort of example of what will be happening with uh, uh, HIV. Genital herpes has probably been with, with humans for maybe millennia, I don't know, but at least centuries. Uh, it's a virus infection, and it, uh, if you look at an individual that has genital herpes, by definition, that person had to have sex with a person that had genital herpes. Mm -hmm. And if you look in most populations, most, quote, general populations, uh, infection rates of genital herpes is very, very low. You look in uh, sex workers, you look in men who have sex with men, uh, you find very high genital herpes rates. Mm -hmm. And so we have now reached probably worldwide uh, what I would call an endemic level of genital herpes. And we will, I think we probably have reached an endemic level of uh, HIV throughout the world. It's not going to explode in the low prevalence countries, but it will still be a risk for those persons in, in low prevalence countries that have the highest level of risk behavior. I don't need to look at his face. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the estimates for HIV prevalence that we have are probably the best for any health problem in the world. I totally agree that the overall estimation of HIV AIDS is probably as good as for any other uh, infectious disease with probably the exception of tuberculosis and tuberculosis the estimates are probably better because of the treatment programs that they've had but for uh, for diseases like malaria etc I think they're also tremendous gross overestimates. In general I would say that they're very reliable for most African countries quite robust. The accusations that we would inflate figures to get more money or that, I mean, frankly, we've been ac accused more about the opposite. Governments say that we are, um, you know, that our estimates are too high um, or too low now. That's, that's what comes from activists. So I think we are in the middle. And, is, and again, it's the best estimates in public health that we have. And we have no political motive. The Estimates in Sub-Saharan Africa have, starting around the late 1990s up to 2000, 2002, uh, have been overestimated by, on average, 50%. And now they're being revised down. So it's hard to respond to that statement that the estimates in Africa are the best robust. Uh, at the present time, they get, they're getting much better. Uh, and I would also agree that they probably, all of them at the present time are in the ballpark. Uh, but there's still, some of them may still be plus or minus 50%. Still plus or minus 50%? Yeah. I know uh, Jim Chin uh, quite well. And uh, I was the chairman of the uh, uh, steering Committee on Epidemiology of uh, the Global Program on AIDS in WHO when Jim Chin was in charge of epidemiologic estimates. And uh, we could never 
uh, get information how the WHO estimates were made then. So we were very critical in these days um, because we felt it was not based on uh, enough evidence. I'm surprised that uh, Dr. Piat said that uh, GPA did not uh, tell the uh, epidemiology group how we came up with our estimates. It's possible that uh, he didn't read the materials we sent them or he didn't understand them, but we did send information to uh, anybody that wanted to know about the estimates because they were pretty transparent in terms of the methodology. Okay. And yours were the more conservative uh, anyway. Yeah, we were, as I say, we, because what little data we had showed in the early days a major urban-rural differential. And when only, we had only data from urban areas, I used a 10 to 1 ratio that the rural areas had one-tenth of the, and I thought that was a conservative uh, uh, estimate. We are really uh, doing a major disservice to say it is uh, not as bad as it looks like because actually it is much worse than what we can capture. Our figures in UNAIDS are very conservative estimates because we don't want to give the impression or we don't want to say we are inflating it for whatever reason. I agree that the numbers are horrendous no matter if they're cut in half or not. But to say that UNAIDS has not accepted uh, gross overestimates, I think, is, uh, is not true. They are now beginning to reduce those estimates. Uh, you just have to look over the last three or four years uh, the marked reductions that have been made. Uh, and now they're getting to be much more robust than they were three or four years ago. Uh, but uh, they have not been uh, what would you say to people that are uh, extremely tense, you know, are really worried, who are in that low risk group, who are bombarded constantly by media saying that everyone's at risk? What would you say to that individual? That they should not engage in any of the HIV risk behaviors, but other than that, uh, because even in low prevalence countries, if they engage in that type of risk behavior, even though the risk of transmission is very low, it's still there. It's, it's just that in populations that have very high levels of these risk behaviors, the prevalence of HIV is very high, and that risk behavior will uh, in, almost invariably in those populations result in infection, whereas in, say, in California, uh, a heterosexual having uh, one or two different sex partners over years, uh, there is a risk, but it's a very, very low risk. So it's, uh, it's not something that, uh, it's a risk that's much less than saying uh, automobile accident deaths. So it's, but there is a risk. That's it. The, the estimates for Haiti went from 6.1% down to 3.8 percent, then down to 2.2 percent, with almost no mention in their text. And except, I think, in one, one of the reports, they said that it's quite possible that HIV incidence has turned the corner in Haiti. See? When was this, when were these revisions done? In the last two re annual reports. Back in 2003, it was almost 6.1 percent for Haiti. Oh wow! And then it's now 2.2 percent. Do you think that'll be further revised down? It's hard to revise it further down. I think that the uh, information I have is that most of the rural areas, uh, HIV prevalence in, in rural females was about one one percent mm -hmm. uh, or less. The urban areas is much higher, so that'll probably kick the national thing to maybe about two. So it, 
it probably will go down much significantly more. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But, but they very little mention of that that kind of a drop. Right. Six point one to two point two. Is that put on the back pages of the report? It wasn't even put on the back pages. It was put in, you know, the country estimates, but and in the text, they they only said that you know there are signs that the HIV uh, situation in Haiti may be turning the corner. <laughs> All right. Okay. Some people are very fortunate that they don't have these side effects. What's it in the final? So what seems to be the same?